So I was unable to walk. It, I never, ever contemplated, you just get up and walk. You don't think about it until you come. And then I'm looking at my legs after I got home and I was in a walker saying downstairs and I'm like, okay, I know, I know one leg has to go in front of the other. Okay, but do I bend my knee? Like it was just to think about how to walk. And I was looking at other people. Oh, okay, so I need to bend that. It was so hard to learn to walk again. I remember walking just from the sofa bed to the toilet and being in so much pain. It was such an effort. And I remember crying out to God in the toilet going, God, help, help me, help. I just, you know, it just was, it was a really, that was a really hard time. People say, you know, why does this happen? And why does your God, you know, allow this? But he, he is a loving father. And I relate to him as a loving father, not as a, a God that stands up there with a, you know, waiting to punish me at every mistake that I make. He's a loving father. Hello and welcome. I'm Tanya Reason and this is the Gospel According to Mum, the show where we discuss the transformational work done in us by Jesus Christ as we live out motherhood and discipleship with Him. We continue now with Tanya Gregg. Tanya's journey with cancer led her on through multiple treatments and surgeries. Even after she lost and relearned the ability to walk, her faith in God has continued to grow as he led her through every trial. We discuss the surprise it still is when God shows us even a tiny portion of the love he has for us and our very human response to his generosity. So, your story's not over yet. There's more, there's more that happens. So at this point, you decide that you need to get some kind of work Mm-hmm. And you start studying for a teacher aid position, mm-hmm. and that is just not working. No, I mean, I thought I want to be around my kids. I, you know, that is still the most important thing to me. So being in a school, I'll be there for school holidays and and school hours. I thought perfect. Well, again, trying to make something happen <laughs> yourself, thinking mm-hmm. okay, well, this is what I'm going to do. Then I'm going to um, study to be a teacher aid so I can work in a school. Everything about that was hard and it doesn't seem like looking back I'm going God, why was that so hard it just was it was online learning which wasn't is not my forte at all I'm a face-to-face learner so and then the the training school they didn't have like the the trainer change and they weren't marking any of my assignments I was asking for help I wasn't getting anything so I thought I'm going to fall behind I need to just crack on with it so I was doing the best I could, trying to do these assessments, submitting them, submitting them. They weren't being marked. I was going on. It was in the back of my mind going, okay, well, I haven't got anything back yet, but I'll keep going. And after about six months, that's when I got my second diagnosis. And that same week I was in hospital was when the new trainer came on and started marking all my assessments. And they started coming back saying, you need to change this. This needs to be added in. There was so much extra work. And I just, it was like that, Again, that Holy Spirit determined saying, stop trying to push that door open. This is not right. And and I just made that decision going, okay, I, I, I get it. I'm going to listen to that discernment, to that voice, and I'm going to, I'm not going to continue with this. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm never meant to work. And that's okay. God, I surrender to you. If I never work again, I'm just going to be the best mother and housewife I could possibly be. And I was 100% okay with that. It was just, it was a, it was a moment where I just surrendered and I was okay with it because I'm like, you know what, God, God will, God will give me the, you know, the satisfaction that I'm looking for. And, and that's fine. I don't have a problem being, you know, just a a stay at home mom at that stage because that's so important to me. Mm. So I just surrendered. I said, okay, I'm going to just start saying yes to you when I recover and just volunteer my time and that's okay. So when I did that, then, um, I recovered from my surgery and my radiation and then I thought, oh, we had a cafe, a breakfast community cafe at the church that I was in and I said, okay, well, I've been in the kitchen so I'm going to just volunteer to be like to be in the cafe. So I started doing that, loved it and then not too long after I'd started, two people, two different people in one week came up to me and asked, oh, have you thought of teaching RI? religious instruction in schools, in state schools. And I said, no, (laughs) never, ever had I thought of, never wanted to do this. That is just, that that was actually quite overwhelming for me. I thought, "Uh, no way. And I don't have the background like to do that, like no way. But it was like three gritted teeth. I'm like, 
Um, okay, I'll do it. I figured two people in one week asking me randomly, God was trying to tell me something. And I said that I'd say yes to him. So <laughs> I, um, I went ahead and started doing the training and was doing, you know, started as an assistant and being in this, in, in a particular school. And then I was doing it on my own for a little while. And we did have a book, but it wasn't the kids that I was scared of. It's probably more the teachers, to be mm-hmm. honest, because kids are quite accepting. So I started doing that. And in this term, after the term, we went away overseas and I had the coordinator contact me and saying, oh, the principal of that school is, is trying to contact you about a job. I'm like, oh, well, it's not me. Like, obviously mistaken identity. I didn't even know <laughs> any job. I don't even know what it is. So it's clearly not me that he is obviously after and she said, oh, maybe just contact him when you get back. And I thought, mm, no, <laughs> it's not me. Like, I am not contacting him at all so, <laughs> because I'm like, no. <laughs> so I didn't. And then when I got back, he contacted me and he just said, oh, you know, are you looking for a – are you working? I said, no. Are you looking for a job? No. Do you want to work? And I said, oh, for the right I, – I, I would consider it for the right job. I had nothing to lose at that stage. Didn't have to work. So – went in for an interview and a chat with him and the business manager and got on like a house on fire and they offered me the job and I started the very next week of the next term and that was five years ago. It was in the office. So I ended up working in a school, school hours, only a few days a week, all around my kids and it's been the best job I have ever had. That's awesome. It's so, I'm, it's so funny to me, to me to hear you talk like that because I started to realise, and it's even more apparent to me now hearing you say it out loud, how similar we are in that we just go, well, that's not working, so that's it. I'll never do that again. You know, and I used to have this idea that, that God would just laugh at me, you know, and that, well, whatever, your, your plan. It's actually shifted now in my mind. I, I realise probably more what he does is just gives me a kiss on the head. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, just you know, just wait. I, I have a, I have it sorted. Um, That's, yeah. <laughs> because you just, well, when you've had a plan and it doesn't work, you just want to get over it, don't you, as quickly as possible. Because yeah. I, don't, I don't like wallowing either. And I think, well, that's not working. So I'm um, just cut that dead. You know, yeah. I don't need that anymore. And then mm. he goes and does something in that area anyway. And you, <laughs> you feel slightly silly for making such a fuss. <laughs> no, 100%. I, I look at back at my life and I think, oh, he's done that several times where I think it's a controlling thing. Mm. He's showing me you can't control everything. Mm. Yeah. And I've had and to you... eat humble pie every time. <laughs> <laughs> and also like uh, it is, it is really tempting to just to just box things away neatly, isn't it? Because then then you don't have to worry about it anymore. But yeah. but God, it, it always irritates me when people say that, that God is messy because I just don't think that's true. I think he's absolutely precise and exactly. perfect in every way. But God's ways are not our ways. Yeah, his boxes are different shapes, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But but you brought the, the scripture, Psalm 37, for delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of yes. your heart. It's, yes. it's seek my kingdom first, isn't it? Look to wow. me. And I'll sort you out. Yeah. Absolutely. And just time and time again, he shows me that. Like, (laughs) I laugh because it's like, wow, it's just not, it's not just words in a Bible. It is true. Like, I am living proof of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a bit like, I mean, as a mother, I see it all the time with my kids. They, They might ask for something and... I'm not averse to them having the thing. It just yeah. has to be done in the right way mm, and at the yes. right time. And it, it, you, you don't say no to your kids because you want them to be unhappy, do you? You just yeah. want you want to give, exactly. but uh, it has Actually, to be done the right really way. Actually, that's a really good point about when we think about our kids and what we would do for them and we can see things that they can't see mm. and then you relate that to your relationship with God going, wow, if I'm like that with my kids, like that is the greatest example of mm. – like, so we can try and relate to what God is like with us as a father. He, he, he is so much more beyond what we would be with our kids. And yet we want good, you know, we want good things for our kids. You know, we don't always want them to have it then. It's timing or we can see it's not going to be good in the future. How much more does God think that about us? Like, yeah. that to me, that blows my mind. Yeah, absolutely. He's got a, he's not a bad God at all. You know, people say, you know, why does this happen? And why does your God, you know, allow this? But he, he is a loving father. 
all and the that, time. Yeah. 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 And I relate to him as a loving father, not as a, a God that stands up there with a, you know, waiting to punish me at every mistake that I make. Mm. He's a loving father. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? When your mind shifts away from that, because we, we do kind of get focused on the, the punishment because we're keeping score a lot. Mm. You know, oh, I did that and oh, I did that. And, and you sort of, in your human mind, you think, how could you, how could you forget about that, you know? But he just says, I love you. I, know. Why, I don't know why it's so hard for us to comprehend, yeah. but, it, but it really is. And we st- it's hard. I remember one day <laughs> I was, wasn't even thinking about anything. I just was chopping pumpkin. I remember that, chopping up pumpkin. And I had this, again, God spoke to me and he said, the love I have for you, you is so so large so it it was just so overwhelming and I just started crying Mm. and it was like I just felt washed with his love and he was showing me only he said I'm showing you just a finger a small a little fingernail of what my love is for you and that just tore me to pieces I Mm. couldn't stand up I was just like just overwhelmed with his love and he was only showing me the teeniest tiniest Mm -hmm. amount that of love that he had for me and that was one of those moments where it was like wow I needed that like I might not have that feeling now but I know that God was showing me how much he loved me Mm -hmm. and that powerful Mm. yeah well speaking of not being able to stand up that brings us to the next stage of your story Mm -hmm. Where you're six months into this this wonderful job, and then you can't walk. Yes, I started having trouble walking. Um, I was limping at first, and like you know, like limping where it's just not right. And then I had um, I had this actually a trip with my church planned to India, and I was starting to not be able to walk very well at that stage, and thinking, well, how am I going to go there? Amazingly, God gave me the grace for those 10 days and I had no issues with walking. Nothing happened at all in India. I came back and, and um, it, the limping got worse. I was trying to get onto a trial with the doctor because the um, hormone um, treatment that I was on, just a tablet, we found out it wasn't working. Mm-hmm. So it was the next stage of treatment. It was like, well, what can we do? There's an immunotherapy trial. Again, I'd always said, no, nah, not going to be a guinea, guinea pig, no. Nah not going to do a trial, never. Mm. And then God changed that. <clears throat> and um, immunotherapy was something I was okay with. So in the process of trying to get on the trial, my walking, which was a couple of weeks, my walking and and legs and hips were just really getting really bad. And it was the weekend, I'd seen the, the professor for the trial and the weekend before, we'd just gone away, we'd come back home. I was meant to, they wanted me to have radiation first before the trial, just to, because that's, radiation is there for pain. So they said, we need to get that sorted before we can go on the trial, so do that first. So I'd, I'd seen the oncologist, the radiation oncologist, I was due to start, I think on the Monday, and on that weekend, it just went really badly came home I think it was on the Saturday or the Sunday we'd gone out for lunch and I couldn't walk up our stairs at all like we'd drive into the garage and then we'd go upstairs mm. and I could not walk I thought maybe I've just done too much I'm a bit exhausted I'll just lay down on the sofa bed down there everyone else went upstairs and then after a bit of a rest I thought no I, I want to get up with the rest of the family mm. and my mum was up visiting like she was up from interstate for or she ended up being up for about eight weeks and I, got, I could barely get up the stairs. By the time I got to the top of the stairs and walked so gingerly, I was in so much pain. I have never actually been in that much pain in my life. And all I wanted to do was just sit on that lounge and I was froze. I could not move and I was just out of my mind in pain. I just, there's nothing that I could describe as that pain. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't even bear. My mom was looking at me, she was panicking. My husband was the same. And I'm like, I couldn't even bear them looking at me. It was like, like their eyes were causing pain. I just, anyway, long story short, they had to call an ambulance and they took me to the hospital and did an x-ray, and, not an x-ray, a CT scan and realised that one of the tumours on my spine or in the vertebrae had actually grown and cracked the vertebrae. So it was like a broken back, basically. <sighs> so yes, radiation was going to happen anyway, but I was in a lot of pain from that. 
had the radiation, couldn't walk at that stage, and then it sort of got worse, way worse before it got better. I was yeah. unable to walk. It, I never, ever contemplated you just get up and walk. You don't think about it until you can't. And then I'm looking at my legs after I got home and I was in a walker saying downstairs and I'm like, okay, I know, I know one leg has to go in front of the other. Okay, but do I bend my knee? Like it was just to think about how to walk. And I was looking at other people, ah, okay, so I need to bend that. It was so hard to learn to walk again. I remember walking just from the sofa bed to the toilet and being in so much pain, it was such an effort. And I remember crying out to God in the toilet going, God, help, help me, help. I just, you know, it just was, it was a really, that was a really hard time. I couldn't do anything for myself. If I went anywhere, I was in a wheelchair. So I really sympathize with people in a wheelchair because you'd be walking along and your eyes naturally go somewhere and you would just follow, you would walk there. No, person in the wheelchair doesn't know that. So they keep walking. I'm like, oh, I want to go there, like yeah. that. And then I was on a, on um, like an old person's walker, like, you know, trying to walk around the house. And then I was on crutches and eventually a walking stick. And then eventually I started walking unaided with a bit of a limp. And then eventually I started walking without a limp, which is where I am now, praise mm. God. Yeah. <laughs> It's crazy. It's like you. It's like so many times you've been aged before your age. I know. It's, just, it's like I've been tried to be taken out all these times, <laughs> and I'm like by his stripes I am healed. Mm. That was hard to say at that time. Very hard to say because I did not look look at at all. A lot of people were thinking that's it. This is the end. I, I but but in one in one sense I never never contemplated. I never contemplated that that was the end ever mm-hmm. I'm just like no I'm going to recover from this and I remember driving past a lake that I used to walk around going when I'm when I can walk properly I'm going to walk around that lake again which is four kilometers and I did yeah. many yeah. many times yeah. you know yeah. yeah well that's the thing I mean we we get focused on the body don't we but but you your life is not your body no matter what happens to it you will yeah. live whether God you know if God says you live then you live there's yeah. no there's no argument it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm sure he could keep us alive on, on you know, if we were just a leg. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, <it's>, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's insane to think that you can't think your way through walking. I oh. know. And I never have, I just, it was a very humbling experience that I, you know, you just don't think about how important that is and just getting up and going to the kitchen or making a breakfast, you just don't think about it until you can't do it. Mm. Was it hard for you at that point as a mother to Very. hand all of those things over? Very hard because my mother was up. She was taking care of me. She was taking my role basically. Mm. She was taking the kids to school. It was quite stressful for her because she as a mother was looking at her child and doing whatever she could possibly do you know, to help me and I'm so independent and used to doing things for myself and my family, it was hard to accept help from my mum mm-hmm. and hard to see her being like doing the things for my family. Even though I was very, very grateful, it was also very frustrating for me because I couldn't do it. I couldn't cook for my family. I couldn't take my kids to school. I couldn't I couldn't do anything basically. And she came so that my husband could go to work and we could try and keep things as normal as possible. And I appreciated it, but I think just so, being so independent, I was getting very, very frustrated. Mm. It was probably a blessing for her, though, in a way, because as you say, having to be strong for your child gives you strength. And she would have been afraid. Oh, definitely. But to be able to come up and, and help you in that way probably gave her strength and was a blessing for her as well. Yeah, at times. At times I know it was very hard for her, so it was both. But I tell you, I'm so grateful, like, to have that time. And she would say the same thing now. Like that was, she came up when I first had my mastectomy for seven weeks. So she's been up many times and driving and like to help us and driving and, you know, and I've seen the, you know, like how hard it has been for her, but she just gets on and do it because that's what you do for your kids. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there it is again. Mm. And so you, you, you did get through all of that and Mm -hmm. you also had to then take the treatment you never wanted to take. Yep, yep. <laughs> so I was on the, well, first of all, I was on the immune. I went back to work after two terms off and blessed because I got income protection insurance, which I never thought was possible uh, with a pre-existing condition, but 
I was able to get that through the policy through work, through my job. And then immunotherapy trial, which lasted for about 13 months, all went really well. They do scans. It's very precise. So they do scans every couple of months to measure. And after 13 months, the whole reason I got onto that trial was because some of the um, tumours had spread to my liver. That's the only reason I got on the trial to start with. Again, I was thinking, oh, my goodness, like, oh. again, every time I think it should go one way, God just, like, <laughs> flips it. So I had to trust him again going, okay, well, it's in my liver now, but I trust you, God, and that's the reason why I got on this trial. And after 13 months, one of the – everything was fine. One of the spots on the liver increased – enough so that I had to come off the trial because they have very strict protocols. So then we had to change treatments. So the option on the table at that stage was chemo. The, the, what I never wanted, really, really ever wanted. And also didn't want to lose my hair because again, it was just, I would, didn't feel, I still didn't feel sick. I wasn't, I haven't like, apart from not being able to walk, I've never actually felt sick. I've never been sick. So it was important to me to not look sick. And I worked in a school. I didn't want my kids to, to see me with no hair. Like I just wanted, be, I just wanted to be as business as normal and to look how I felt, which was well. Mm. So the first chemo, there was two two types of drugs, two chemos. One of them, you didn't lose your hair, and I opted for that one first, and it just didn't agree with me. So after they do scans after two months and it hadn't stopped the growth of um, some of the spots. So that was taken off the table. And then the next drug, chemo, that was available was the one where you lose your hair, which is why I never chose that one. So I said, well, I had no choice at that stage. I said, okay. They said there is a cooling cap you can wear, but that's only available to private patients. And even though I had private health insurance, I was under the same doctor. I was in the public system under the same doctor from the trial, which was important to me just to have some continuity. So I said, well, how can I, I'm happy to pay privately for this cooling cap. You know, it's not guaranteed to keep your hair, but it's a, it's probably your best, your best chance. Mm-hmm. So they said, oh, well, you know, people have asked before when they're in public if they can have it and it's a no, like they just, it's in a separate, they have these machines in the private section, not in the public section. And it takes much longer because you have to have it on your head for much longer in order for it to work or to hopefully work. So they said, the best you can do is write a letter, you know, to whoever's in charge and, and plead your case. I said, okay. So I did that. I wrote a letter, pleaded my case and said why it was important to me. And by God's grace, he allowed that to happen. Mm-hmm. So I was able to have my treatment in the private part of the hospital with the cooling cap on, which is I call it the freezing cap because it puts icicles. It's so cold. It puts icicles on your head. A lot of people can't take it for a very long or they have to take a Panadol because it's very tight. It's very, very cold and only works for 30% of people. So now it's almost been three years. I'm still on the same treatment. And as you can see, yeah. still have all my hair, like thick hair. They, they actually can't believe that I have so much hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look like you've been on any kind of treatment at all. No, yeah, yeah. I have none of the other... <laughs> Welcome to Australia, everyone. Yes. <laughs> Our beautiful <Yes>. wildlife. Mm. <laughs> the dulcet tones of a lovely crow. Yes. Yeah. The crows. <laughs> if it's not them, it's the magpies. Yeah. <laughs> or dogs. Yeah, um, yeah so I've, I've had zero side effects. I go three weeks out of four every once, every once every week and I have a blood test and I have a cannula. And I have this treatment and I walk in, I call it my, my job on a, on a Thursday. Mm. I go in. I do what I have to do. I know that God gives me the grace. I actually pray like grace every time that they are administering the drug to me. I say it in my head like grace. I just say, bless it to my body. Let it do only exactly what it's supposed to do and nothing else. Yeah. And I think we do that over food that we put in our body. Well, ask God to bless it. Well, why wouldn't I do the same over this? So Absolutely. I've zero side effects. They always ask at the start of the treatment, you know, do you have, you know, this, 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 and this? No, 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 no. Great. They, they are they always shocked. And, but, um, yeah, it's been nearly three years and all I can say is it's God's grace that he has allowed me to go through that and to 
be in the fire with me and I don't even smell that smoke. Yeah, that's amazing. It just, it shows, and we're going to double back because the story that you've just told and, and what we're about to talk about is the same sort of idea that it doesn't matter what people say because God is above what any man can write or say or do. And, you know, they said, well, you can't possibly have this. Well, God said, yes, you can. And when you were looking for income protection and and then the back and forth with your insurance company, Mm. they tried to write a label over you, didn't they? And Mm. you said, fine, write this word, but it's not the word I'm going to use. And it's it's not the word God's going to use. What happened there? So after the, well, first of all, I was quite surprised that I was receiving any income protection for a pre-existing condition that they already knew about. Um, so that was a blessing in itself. And there's a lot of paperwork with that. So I thought, there's no, what's the, what is the point? So I rang them and they said, yes, yes, the policy you're under does um, cover you. I'm like, okay, fine. So I was continuing on that. And then after five months, they say, well, look, our company protocol is that after this amount of time, you know, you actually might be eligible for a terminal payout. And immediately I said, I don't want that because I didn't want the word terminal and I felt like that's not how I'm living. I live like I'm healed and that for me was quite a sticking point. I just said, I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. I don't want it. Can I can just continue on income protection because my plan is to go back to work and I don't want it. And as it turns out that they have, obviously she got she was very understanding the caseworker and she said I have to follow company policy we have to get two doc two different doctors that have to sign off to say that you are a terminal so uh, in the end there was nothing I could do I, I sent an email I asked if they could not if I could not have this payment basically and just continue on until I get back to work which was not that long long away I, I thought mm. but they said no so the first doctor the oncologist had to sign off and she said look I'm really sorry she said as soon as it spreads f- from anywhere it's metastatic and as soon as it's metastatic there's always the the chance that you know you can pass away within two years based on statistics and I said to her, I said, okay. I said, you write what you have to. I said, but I don't believe that. I, I'm, I don't live that way. So that's fine. I just thought nothing I can say is going to change that. So she did that. My GP had to do the same. <laughs> that's what was required. I submitted it. I had um, specific prayer over that because I didn't want that. I didn't want that label hanging over me. Mm. And during that prayer session, it was actually, and I never thought of it this way, but she, the um, lady that was praying for me said, well, maybe maybe this is a blessing. Maybe God's using it to bless you. And I thought it just it was just, again, another shift going, well, actually, maybe he is because maybe he's, you know, we're blessed to be a blessing to others. Mm. And in the end, I ended up getting this terminal payout. And by the time that I got it, I was actually 100% okay with that. I realized, you know, again, what the – enemy means for evil god will use for his good and it was the exact amount to pay out our mortgage Mm -hmm. at that stage and my husband had always said he wanted he would love to have had our mortgage paid off by the time he's 40 and he'd turned 40 a couple of months before i wasn't yet 40 i got it literally got it in my bank account two months before i turned 40 Mm -hmm. and we were able to pay off our house (laughs) it's just like he averaged you guys see your one flesh he put you together and worked it out um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so that was such a blessing. Like, again, like pressed down, shaken and just overflowing blessing again without even seeking any of it. Yeah, yeah. I really think that part of our our Christ-like walk as disciples is to undo the work of the devil. We are supposed to go around as salt and light to undo that work Mm -hmm. and and he is he is exhibiting that in your life that it doesn't matter what they wrote over you yes he will undo it absolutely you know it's it's up to him in every way and I wish that we could think about that when we are cautious about sharing faith and talking about God in the world because it doesn't matter what anybody says we don't need to be afraid do we no. And I used to think it was my resp- responsibility, you know, like, you know, to bring people to God. But now I, now I, he's taught me that it's my responsibility to plant seeds everywhere I go. I always give him the glory, yeah. but I am not the 
I'm not their judge. And that's the Holy Spirit's job to come and convict them, you know, like to to become a follower of, of Christ. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's not my job. Like, it's not me I, that calls, is it? It's him. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I just make sure that I'm, I, I, my prayer is that I'm always pointing people to God because it's nothing I've done. You know, it's all by God's grace and I'll plant seeds everywhere I go. Yeah. You had another event recently where you've had to go in and, and have some more tests and, and treatments and things. And you said at the end that that your husband and you talk about it now is you just have to go in and have a tune up every exactly. now and then, <laughs> which, exactly. you know, you, you found, you found some, some humor in the way that you're living with this, but you've got this thing sort of lurking in your life now. It's, it's as if you are bearing this cross, isn't it? You're having to live with this thing that mm-hmm. just is mm-hmm. there. And it reminded me, you actually brought 2 Corinthians twelve nine, but when I read that, I thought back a couple of verses where Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations. It was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. But the Lord's response to his request is, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's the scripture that you brought. Oh. My power is made perfect in weakness. Oh, that is my life. Absolutely. Like yeah. I can so relate to Paul with that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And it's just his... It's just another avenue, isn't it, for him to reveal his utter sovereignty. Mm. As disciples, it's really important for us to recognize his complete sovereignty, isn't it? Yeah. He is the yeah. Lord. Yeah. Absolutely. And, it, and again, it is harder, harder done sometimes, you know, but it's just, it's, it's impossible for me to not credit God when I see his hand, his sovereignty in, in all of this. Mm. Yeah. There was just one other point that I wanted to, to make with you about your story. And it's so funny, my husband, he, he says to me, God doesn't talk to me, but he so frequently talks through my husband and he did it just before we started talking this morning. Because I was thinking about the way you were writing, and I do it too, where he was saying, God blessed me again and he blessed me again. And it was almost, you know, a surprise It's almost a surprise, isn't it, when God blesses you? But, I mean, if you think about how we are with our kids, Mm. I'm never surprised by how much I want to bless my children. It just comes out of me, whether I'm thinking about it or not. In fact, almost to a fault. Like sometimes I think, oh, perhaps I'm spoiling them now. Like they don't, they don't need that. I just, I just wanted to to do it, you know, or or wanted to give it to them. And it reminded me of the the parable in, in Matthew twenty one to fifteen, where um, the landowner goes out and he gets workers, and at the end they all get paid the same. Mm-hmm. And he says, um, he says, I'm not being unfair to you because the, the 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 workers who came early said, why are they getting the same as us? Mm-hmm. And he says, are you envious because I'm generous? We almost can't comprehend God's generosity. Why is it? such a surprise to us that he's generous I don't know I just it's it's a surprise and then it's not a surprise going well of course because of course God wants to bless his children but I'm not worthy of being I'm not worthy of being blessed but then is that is that pride as well yeah (laughs) I think there's a there's a prideful element isn't there because I don't hold to this this idea of being expectant you know like I can go to God and say, this is what I want, and then expect him to fulfill it. I think that's kind of how a toddler talks. Yeah. You know, I don't think yeah. we're, we're meant to be that. But but if I have a need, and he, he will supply generously, yeah. won't he? And the thing that blows my mind is that so frequently, not only does he supply it, but there's a real thought to my personal happiness as well, isn't there? Absolutely. Everything about us he cares about. And sometimes that is that is hard to fathom going, I'm just one person in this entire universe right now, not to mention everyone that's come before me. And God knows everything about me and cares about every little bit in my life. He does. You know, it, it is is very hard to comprehend. But if we, again, if we think about what we are like with our children, how much more is God with us? Yeah. And, he, and like... He is the creator of everything and he is the creator of us and he is our heavenly father. What we what what we can conjure with our children, he can conjure so much more with us and he never wants bad for us. He always has he always has our eternal 
providence basically yeah. like at hand like it's all about it's not right now that might not be good for us right now but but what does that mean for the future he can mm-hmm. he's outside of time and space he can see everything that we can't yeah and again it's faith and it's trust yeah, to yeah. trust that he knows what is best yes yeah i mean that's how we are with our kids isn't it we're always thinking about their future how is this going to be for your future yeah i mean of course he is thinking that way because that's everything we think comes from him i know yeah just listening to your story and the different things that you've brought, I can see straight away that, that you know, I can't put you in a box either. There's, there's such complexity around all of the things that you've faced and all of the realisations that you've come to. We almost have, like, it it's, it's almost seems foolish not to trust him with it mm. all because, I mean, do you feel like, do you feel like you know yourself better now or that you, you don't know yourself at all? I know myself better in him, I would say. I know, like, it is continuing. It hasn't finished. It is, he teaches me all the time and in every circumstance, you know, like my faith with him grows every day and even when I feel like it's not there, you know, it, it does. It actually grows and my trust in him grows and I would say I've learnt to take eyes off myself and to have less in just to have the right perspective. God is number one. I can't control everything. And whilst this vessel here, this body is important on earth, we still need it for his purposes. It is not the be all and end all and he is. Yeah. So yeah. it's just continually, yeah, I, I am a different person now to what I was eight years ago, seven yeah. years ago, yeah. completely different. Yeah. Well, it's that, not about me anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The relationship that brings me back around to what, what Ben said just before we started this interview because he, he came in and I apologised to him for him having to help me this morning and he said, goodness sake, can you just stop keeping score and, mm. and just let me help you? It's not about being beholden to me. You don't owe me one. He said, just accept help from me. And then he said this beautiful line and I thought, this is, this is God. He just said, it's a nice relationship to be in, Tanya. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we would always think that about the other person, mm-hmm. but sometimes, and maybe it is a pride thing, it's hard to accept help and to accept that someone wants to help us. Yeah, and that God wants to help us and it's, it's okay to accept his help too. It's a yeah. nice relationship to be in. It's a nice it? relationship to be in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so much for everything you've shared. It's been so wonderful to talk to you. I'm so glad you came on. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to share. Thanks for listening today. You can find out more about the show, our guests, and subscribe and download through all our channels by visiting thegospelaccordingtomum.com. If you've been impacted by this show, I encourage you now to share the news with others. Subscribe to us on Facebook and Instagram to help us spread the word. Those who've known God in motherhood, anything of his nature, and what it is to walk with Christ have enormous scope to support those who are younger in the way. Please consider if you can share your experience and contact the show. As Tanya Gregg says, it need not just be a testimony for you, but for all of us. In the meantime, be encouraged, friend. And remember, the God who taught you to love will not leave you as you walk with him more and more at your own pace. I'm Tanya Reason, and you've been listening to The Gospel According to Mum. Till next time.